Hi guys, how's everyone doing? Um, I am very excited to be here with you guys. Um, you're both pros in your industry. I started my career at CNN when I was like 23 years old, a couple of years ago, uh, covering the second wave of tech innovation. This was the rise of mobile apps like Twitter uh, and that transformed democracy, the sharing economy companies like Airbnb and Uber that transformed the global landscape. And it certainly feels like we are on the cusp of a new generation of the internet with artificial intelligence. Um, only it feels like the stakes this go around are even higher and um, the implications uh, it, are humanity. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys about this. David, I would love to start with you. Your work has transformed the advertising industry. So through this lens, I think you'll have a very unique perspective um, on this. When we talk about the promise of artificial intelligence, what is the promise? What is the peril? Wow, that's a broad question. Hello, by the way. Thank I thought you. we'd start light <laughs> start with everyone. Light. <laughs> well, the, the promise is immense. And like all technology, it's a tool and it depends on how you use it. And I think it's, there's a lot of anxiety and excitement wrapped up and people toggle between two and everyone we talk to sees that. I don't think it's going to make good people bad or bad people good. It's just going to amplify and accentuate what's happening. But at the speed that things are happening, I feel like as a creative person, it's going to allow us to get to output quicker and give us um, more, more opportunities than we've ever had before. So I, I, it's one of those interesting things where it depends who you talk to, but every client we, we talk to, it's the number one thing on their agenda. And in the same conversation, they talk about you know, how, how this is going to reinvent their business or how this is going to save their business. And laden below that is they're worried about how it's going to destroy their business. Right. And the truth lies somewhere in between all three. Um, and Sinan, you've been studying technology since 1999. You've published many influential papers. Uh, you famously said, fake news travels faster than the truth. This was coined. Um, and you've also been at the forefront of tech for good campaigns at a global scale. So through that lens, what is the promise? What's the peril? Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to, to be here. Um, I think one thing we have to remember is that AI innovation is exponential. And human beings are terrible at thinking exponentially. We think very linearly. So if you think about, if you, if you are uh, aware of ChatGPT, for example, just think about this. The difference in the performance of ChatGPT 3.5 versus ChatGPT 4, where it was scoring something like in the 10th percentile on the LSAT at 3.5 and in the 90th at four, now imagine what 20 looks like. So we can't really understand what the promise or the emergent peril is gonna be uh, as well as we think we might. But a few things that jump out at me in terms of the promise are, think about the potential for uh, drug discovery. Think about the potential for uh, accurate and mass radiology re readings, or think about breakthroughs in protein folding. If you think about protein, uh, the way that proteins are structured determines how they operate, and so this could lead to drug discovery, it could lead to the use of proteins to get rid of industrial waste. Alpha fold has uh, 200 times increased the predicted protein structures in a single year. On the bad side, think about misinformation. Think about, you've recently heard of AI songs uh, by Drake and Jay-Z infringing on copyright. You've heard of AI scams where people are calling grandmothers with their grandchildren's voices and asking for money. But more importantly, think about an optimized uh, advertising system that is designed to manipulate elections. Research shows that it won't change how we vote, but it can change whether we vote. And if you think of a portfolio that is designed to change elections on a mass scale across the world, that is very dangerous. Uh, AI bias is another one. AI is trained on data that exists today. It bakes in gender bias and race bias. And so we have to really be thinking about the promise and the peril. And I, a lot of that, if you think about 
CEOs impact comes from a lot of these big companies these days. And you, David, you're advising a lot of these CEOs on corporate responsibility. Uh, Accenture Song recently put out a report on generative AI. So when we think about corporate responsibility in AI, if you could just give us, I love specifics. So like take us to the boardroom. You're having these internal meetings with the CEOs of these massive companies that we hear about every day. What, are, what questions are they asking you about corporate responsibility and AI? What are you advising them to think about as they incorporate AI into their business models? Well, I think first thing is it's great that we're starting these conversations around responsibility as opposed to playing catch up like we have in the past with technology. I think the sort of euphoria of technology, people leapt into it and then tried to reverse engineer sort of to mitigate some of the, the damage. I think now every conversation starts with what is the responsibility of the firm and it doesn't just reside within the corporation or within their consumers and customers. They understand now that they are corporations are citizens as well. So they look at the ramifications of that. You know, it's about transparency. It's very much about sort of seeing the human in this. It's, it's about being open. You know, I feel like that's the sort of conversations we try and delve into with them, as opposed to just getting to the, the, the added speed or convenience or competitiveness of it. You know, we, 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 we won't just present a proposal until we've sort of asked a lot of tough questions that make people very uncomfortable to get there. And I think that's a really, really good thing. Because as I said, people are excited, but they're also slightly terrified by it. So we're sort of in making sure that that terror isn't paralyzing, but it's a chance for us to actually, no one's going to get it all right at the stage we're in, but we can start with the best of intentions to do that. So like, what kind of uncomfortable questions would you ask? Like, let's say I'm a CEO, I'm asking you, what uncomfortable questions do you ask me to ask myself? What, what, how do you feel about the displacement of employees? Like, if this, what, what, what this does to your, your yeah. employee base, is that, are you fine with that? I'm not, I'm, we, don't, we don't lead the answers. Yeah. We just ask them sort of some hard questions before they get to sort of like increase quarterly results. Like, what, do you, what does this do to your staff? Right. And you come through with, you know, is this going to... Now, there's advantages because, it, you know, it'll, it'll change things from outsourcing to back to, you know, onshore. You know what I mean? I think that that's what's one of, it, the, the, one of the advantages. But it's really sort of just understanding how it has a profound impact beyond, as I said, just the quarterly results and the, and, and the products they produce or services they produce. Right. And a lot of the conversation now is also on government and responsibility and how we can create regulatory environments now before it's too late. Um, and so I would say, Sanan, to you, I think earlier this month, this month, the Biden administration, they announced it's gathering comments on prospective accountability measures for artificial intelligence. So if we could look at like, and maybe this is a tough one to, to throw at you, but like the single most important thing uh, that the US government could do right now that's actionable as we enter an AI arms race that could push us in the right direction. Uh, what, what advice? Would you, would you the say? The silver bullet? Do you want the silver bullet? I don't know. I thought, uh, you know, <laughs> we just got to speak in platitudes. Right. Um, so it's interesting to see various governments around the world having very different approaches to AI. So if you, if you look over at Europe, uh, they've just, I think, concluded a negotiation about the AI Act uh, that follows roughly uh, along the same path uh, as prior legislation in Europe around digital technologies. Um, the U.S. is gathering comments. There's widespread conversation about should there be a moratorium or should there not. Uh, I think that having a moratorium requires a universal moratorium because otherwise it's sort of like a one-sided ceasefire uh, where one side decides to put down their guns but nobody else does. So I think moratoriums that are not universal don't work at all. I think the single greatest uh, thing, the single most important thing that governments around the world can do is to uh, provide frameworks for what David talked about, which is transparency. That's what we lacked in the last, what I called the new social age of Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Uh, and we currently lack it in the AI age. We don't know what's underneath the hood of the black box large language models or generative AI models. We don't know what data they're being trained on. We don't know how they're evolving from one step to another. And that makes it very difficult to understand where they're going to take us and what kind of mistakes they're going to make and what types of nonlinear 
um, responses they're going to have to various prompts. And so I think that requiring transparency to some degree is extremely important. I understand, obviously, I'm an entrepreneur and an investor. I understand the concept of competitive advantage and trade secrets and so on. It's not that everything has to be revealed, but there has to be a secure framework for transparency so that scientists and regulators can have an idea of what's going on in order to have the ability to dynamically make rules and establish guardrails for the technology as it evolves. And, and just to build, as you said about, you know, transparency to understand what's behind that. You know, that Samsung case where the, they put, uploaded some of their proprietary source code, That's right. thinking that it was kept in a safe arena so they could get some answers back from ChatGDP, and it actually used their own source code and, to educate itself, and that's been sort of diluted and polluted around for others. So it's, again, making sure that you're for of this and not really knowing what's... You, you don't just leap into it, because it, once it's out there, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's, it's, it's impossible to put it back in. Um, one thing that was really interesting we spoke about before, David, is you guys have this partnership that really gets into some philosophical questions about what it truly means to be a global citizen. Um, talk to us a little bit about the initiative to turn the Pacific island of Tuvalu into the first fully uh, digitized nation and some of the more philosophical questions that brings up. Well, it is interesting. I mean, there's sort of dovetails between what's going on in the world, you know, with... with uh, the environment and obviously the, the sort of arms race of technology is, you know, Tuvalu is, is probably the canary in the mine as far as uh, nations that are going to be impacted or are being impacted by uh, the rising seas. And it's, in, it's basically almost inevitable that the entire nation is going to disappear because of the rising sea. So we've sort of spent our time trying to, we've digitised the entire, well, my phone's going off, sorry, digitised the entire nation and not just to preserve records of every artifact and every facet of, of the nation, but also to, to, to ask the question of what constitutes a nation? Can you have digital sovereignty? Like what are the rights of people when that nation disappears? What are the rights, can they still be citizens? Can they still have trade acts? You know, is it recognized as a country when, when eventually they get moved, the population has to be deployed and moved elsewhere? Can they still retain the rights? So it's just opportunities for us to use technology and look at things in a way that, uh, as I said, it's not all for just profit and uh, quarterly results. You can actually have, you know, ways to solve some, some of the headiest challenges. Now, it's, it's a project that we hope that we actually never finish hmm. because, you know, if we can sort of course correct and reverse, in, reverse any of the sort of the, the, the climate change whatsoever, then maybe it won't take over the whole country. But again, it's, it's looking at things in a way from a, an impact point of view, which is, you know, perfect audience to be talking to that about. It is interesting because in Silicon Valley, a lot of folks are talking about could a country fully exist in the cloud? Right? Well, it, this, 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 it, it looks like it will be. I mean, it's already recognized by nine different countries as a... As, I mean, as, that's a crazy concept. To I think. mean, it is, it's such an abstract. But again, as we're talking about, we have to get used to these yeah. linear, I mean, these less linear, more lateral uh, concepts. Right. Um, I thought we could do a little bit of a lightning round um, because we don't have much time left, but I, I want to get to a lot with you guys. Sanan, um, biggest lesson you've learned about the future of deep fakes after becoming one? <laughs> yes, so uh, quick story behind that. I was deep faked by Russian hackers uh, w who set up an elaborate scheme to scam people out of money using me and George Clooney to sell a Scott stock trading algorithm and a master class on how to uh, solve the stock market. So that's the story. Uh, big, biggest lesson, biggest lesson that I've learned with regard to deep fakes or AI? Uh, about deep fakes. Yeah, yeah, deep fakes. So I think that the, the, main, the main thing that I think people need to understand, the nonlinearity there, is that um, you know, the, the misinformation of the, the 2020 election uh, is child's play compared to what is possible with deep fake audio and video. And the real turbocharged problem with that is the ability of optimization engines to sort of scale that. that that's really the thing. And uh, when you think about it, it's not going to be a dramatic change in an election like in the United States, I don't think. I think what it's going to be is it's going to be a portfolio of attempts to uh, manipulate um, local elections or uh, countries that aren't prepared in vast numbers, maybe in Africa or Southeast Asia or in Eastern Europe, 
Uh, and once you start thinking that way, you start to see how it's going to be much more subtle, but potentially even more dangerous than a dramatic event might be. David, uh, you're in a top position now, but you started at the bottom. Most valuable lesson you learned in the mailroom? Well, what I learned as I started the mailroom and now I'm a CEO is that the person in the mailroom and the CEO have the most, both of them have the most influence in a company. <laughs> One does it from stealth and overhearing stuff they're not meant to know, but they really know what's going on. And one does it from power and, 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 um, and position and title. But as I said, you know, find yourself a way to, to be malleable and learn along the way. And just always, no matter what, adapt for change. And we're talking about that now. You know, and what, the world I started in the mailroom is, the essence of what it was is redundant, but the actual output and the need for it is, is you know, how it manifests itself as change, but start scrappy, and that's the only way to do it, I think. You fast forward 20 years, you both are fathers. What does a world with responsible artificial intelligence look like for your children? I have a nine-year-old, and uh, it makes me think, dream big and wonder and see what creativity can ignite in my son, and it also scares me to death in a lot of ways. Uh, the best way I can think about its effect on kids is to think about the difference between, say, dopamine and Duolingo. So these systems are designed to trigger the dopamine system in kids. I see it with my son every day. When it's time for his iPad time to be over, I am nowhere to be found for 15 minutes. That basically saves me because uh, I don't have to see him or talk to him for that 15 minutes when he's coming off of his dopamine high. But also, uh, Duolingo, Duolingo allows you to scale language learning all over the world essentially for free. And this is something, it, it's just one example of the things that it can bring our children. I mean, I have four children and you know, it, it's, they're all very creative, so my house is a shit show. But what, you know, they're worried that, or people are worried that it's going to sort of just wipe out creativity, and I actually don't think it is. It's going to wipe out the sort of mediocre middle from a creative perspective and the sort of paint-by-numbers side of it. But there's always room for originality and connections and, you know, reinterpretation of things. And I think that as creative people, I, I want them to, to see it as a tool and put humanity in that, and, and that's what's going to be uh, amazing. Although one of my kids said to me, I think... I should be interested in cybersecurity. I said, that's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> you said, David, you said the other day, you said responsibility isn't compromise. I think we could end on that. Um, you said the other day to me, responsibility isn't compromise. Well, I think that that's, that's really important. I think, you know, um, you know it, our job is to, is to take things with the best of intentions. And, you know, responsibility lies with us no matter what's in front of us. And we've just got to make sure that that is not compromised along the way at all. And I feel like uh, creative people have a mission, a mission based people and outcome based. And I don't think whatever's going on in technology wise that they're going to compromise on that. Hey, David Sanan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks.